No great Alaskan adventure is complete without a visit to Skagway, the famous gold rush town that never had any gold. But the thing about driving to Skagway is you have to drive down a very long, very steep hill. And one of us made the mistake of trusting the wrong mechanic to bleed their brakes. You trash talking me right now? <laughs> Mick. Mick, I'm not trash talking you, but I'm just being honest. Got about halfway down that hill, the brakes were hardly functional. So you're blaming me for the whole thing? Well, I mean, you installed them. Do you wanna go? Yeah, I wanna friggin' go. You wanna go? <laughs> you friggin' know I wanna go. You wanna go? Yeah, I do wanna go. I'm ready to go. Let's go. You wanna go? Just waiting for you, bud. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Let's go. <laughs> I can't wait to see Skagway. Bud, you're gonna love it. So Skagway was a gold rush boom town. Um, we were actually the second choice. Um, Dai was the big boom town during the gold rush. Uh, Skagway only really became into being because they built the railroad here. Skagway became an actual big town once the railroad got finished two years later, but that was a full year after the gold rush was completely over. So if you would have ended up taking the train up there, you wouldn't end up working for somebody. Only the first few dozen men up there actually got any gold claims in their name. Everybody after them was just an employee. So unless you were the first couple dozen folks up there, you didn't really make any money off the gold rush. Most of the money in the gold rush was made right here in Skagway, selling goods to the people going up. They were coming off these steamships from Seattle and Portland, um, completely ill-prepared for what the journey ahead of them was. They thought as soon as they got off the ship, there was gonna be gold sitting right up on top of the ground and they'd be instant millionaires. Once they got to Skagway, there was notices by the Canadian police posted all over town telling them what was ahead of them. And it was a two-page list of supplies the Canadians wanted you to have in order to get into Canada. Everything they thought you were going to need to survive a whole year in northern Canada was zero assistance. And so unless you had absolutely everything on that list, the Canadian Mounties wouldn't let you into Canada. And so you bought most of it here in Skagway. And it would take you 40 or 50 trips with everything on your back going up and down this Chilkoot Trail to get it all cashed to Canada Customs before they would let you through. Dai blew up because the Chilkoot Trail was the most popular way to get up into the Gold Rush. It was a little more direct than the White Pass Trail. Uh, if you chose to hike the White Pass Trail, you had to pay a toll to a guy named George Brackett in town. And you do significantly less trips with a horse and buggy, but once you got to the top, you realized that's where the trail ended and you still had quite a distance to go before you can put into the first major lake. Where if you did the Chilkoot Trail, you would have to do 40 or 50 trips with everything on your back, but once you got everything cached at the top, all your goods, then you were at the shores of Lake Bennett where you could build a raft, float across the other lakes that connect with Lake Bennett to the last one, funnels out into the Yukon River right at Whitehorse, and the current actually conveniently goes north all the way up to Dawson City, Yukon, where all that gold was found. There was a zinc mine out of Faro Yukon that kept us alive for quite a few years. Uh, they were bringing it all down on the rail system. And then in 1979, we finished our highway in and out of town and that almost overnight bankrupted the White Pass Rail Company. They ended up selling out to a Canadian company called Tri-White out of Toronto, Canada, who was the owner of it until either June or July of 2018 when they sold to a partnership between Carnival Cruise Line and Survey Point Holdings. Once Tri-White Corporation bought the White Pass Rail, they turned it into a tourism operation. 
and that I believe is what brought the cruise ships coming to Alaska and the cruise ships is what made Skagway thrive. In order to get to Skagway, there's a few different ways you can get there. The reason I've been able to live here as long as I have is road access. Uh, we are different from most Southeast Alaska towns and there's the fact that we actually have a highway that leads out of town. It's us, our neighboring town of Haines, which is about 12 miles away by water, or a seven and a half hour drive, 350 miles. And then Hyder, Alaska, which is just east of Ketchikan. Those are the three communities in Southeast Alaska you can drive in and out of. If you're driving in off of the Alaska Highway and you decide to make the detour down into Skagway, um, the first half hour of your drive is pretty, pretty spectacular, but the last 45 minutes to an hour coming down the White Pass um, all the way down into Skagway, that's jaw dropping. It is the most popular excursion in Skagway. Um, like in Juneau, everybody's got to check out the glacier or go whale watching in Skagway. Everyone has to go to the White Pass. Skagway to the White Pass Summit, the, you go through three different ecosystems and each one looks very different than the one before. Every single month of the year offers something in that view that the other ones don't. Uh, if you come here at the beginning of the summer, you're going to see so much snow up in the mountains. You come June or July, you're going to start to see the glaciers. And if you start coming in the latter part of September, you'll see snow in the tops of the mountains. We call it termination dust, slowly making its way lower and lower each day. This week, we're going to be taking on, I think, the largest single episode reposition in destination adventure history from Skagway, Alaska, all the way to Prince Rupert, British Columbia, which is a pretty important little town on this channel. Prince Rupert is kind of where this YouTube channel came to life. I have some great connections in that town, and in four days, the Grand Princess will be arriving. <laughs> I have several special friends on that ship and it would mean the world to me to get the opportunity to take them out on some type of adventure in my home province of British Columbia. So I've reached out to one of my sponsors from last year and we've planned a pretty fun little trip. But that leaves me three days to cover 1600 kilometers of rough northern road. Let's get into it. Long travel days do make filming difficult, but they're some of my favorite days. Hour after hour of beautiful landscapes, mile upon mile without cell phone reception, and town after town without hardly another person. One, we drove late into the evening and made it to one of my favorite camp spots at French Creek. The morning brought with it a beautiful sunny day 
and our one and only planned stop. Of all the times I've taken this route, I've intentionally avoided Boya Lake because to me it kind of seems like a tourist spot. But recently some tourists were telling me how beautiful it is. So we're gonna take the time and pop down for a quick look, then we're out of here. This place is a total friggin' tourist trap and it's a provincial park so I can't even fly the drone. I'll show you guys a way better lake than this. This is one of my favorite lakes in the entire world. Right on the border of British Columbia and the Yukon, absolute pristine, crystal clear water. Welcome to Good Hope Lake. really difficult to get the motorhome down to the boat launch here so I'm not putting the boat in this year but I did last year for a patron video so I'll give you guys a little peek. Freaking Boya Lake, you can keep it. Let's whip it. Today's the big day. Last leg of our reposition. And let me tell you guys, it feels great to be back in Northern British Columbia. Feels like I'm home. There you have it. You can plan and prepare as much as possible, but in the end, mother nature is boss. And unfortunately, the second half of this adventure is on the receiving end of that reality. It's not safe to even attempt this float plane tour that I had planned, but I wanna give a big thank you to Ocean Pacific Air for stepping up to the plate and even offering to make this idea a reality. I definitely still want to get out with them while I'm here in Prince Rupert. It just won't be the surprise for my friends that I had planned. That being said, I still had a wonderful day with some wonderful people, but the time constraints of this YouTube lifestyle have unfortunately gotten the best of me this week. Today is Friday, which makes tomorrow upload day at five in the morning. Obviously, I don't have time to try and put together a plan B adventure for this week. I'm sorry about that, but next week I'll be back with another full-length, well-produced episode. Most of all, thanks for watching, everybody. As always, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints, and I'll catch you on the next one.
Good feeling. 